medications, um, uh, drug metabolizing enzymes, and transcranial magnetic uh, stimulation. Um, he has uh, almost 300 publications that are highly cited, and his recent work has been focusing on cannabis, the pharmacodynamics of cannabis and, uh, and cannabinoids, and also synthetic cannabis. And he has a major interest in policy questions and um, has started a new journal. He's editor-in-chief of the Journal of Cannabis Research, which is a very timely publication for us. And um, I would like to just introduce him to you right now to talk about his topic, which is listed above. Let us all welcome Dr. David Gorelick. switch. That's better. Thank you, Edie, for that kind introduction. Um, but Edie didn't mention, and I've known her for several decades, because we, uh, she was already at the NIDA Engineering Research Program when I was recruited uh, in 1989 as part of their effort to uh, solve the crack cocaine epidemic. Needless to say, those efforts were not successful. Uh, as I reassured my children, uh, Daddy's not going to put himself out of a job. Uh, but after um, uh, 24 years working there and the last several years primarily on cannabis. Uh, I retired and now I'm uh, part-time as a professor at the University of Maryland, as you heard. So what I'm going to talk about today actually does not involve any of my own primary research, but now that I'm no longer a federal employee, I have gotten interested in some of the public health and public policy implications of this somewhat controversial uh, topic. I should start, of course, with my speaker disclosure, since you can get CME credit for this. So I do get speaking fees from hospitals and medical societies for presentations on medical cannabis. Uh, I write many of the cannabis and cocaine topics in the psychiatry section of Up to Date, and I get royalties every time you click on one of the articles. Um, and most recently, I get honoraria from Colorado State University at Pueblo and Springer for being editor-in-chief of this uh, new journal, just open for submissions in September, Journal of Cannabis uh, Research. So uh, I do have flyers in front. You can get my card. It's an open access journal, but no fees. Fees are waived. <laughs> Anything to do with cannabis, the plant, the cannabinoids, endocannabinoids uh, is within our purview. I'm happy to talk to anyone after my talk. Uh, but today I'm going to focus uh, in about 35 minutes, so we have about 15 minutes for questions at the end. A very brief history of medical cannabis, and then bring you up to date on the current status of federal and state levels. Then what's known about the epidemiology of medical cannabis in this country. And then the main body of my talk, what evidence we have on the public health implications of medical cannabis legalization. So this is a brief history of medical cannabis. The main points I want to make is uh, we have evidence of medical use going back at least 5,000 years, particularly in Asia, China, South Asia, but certainly spreading into Europe by the Greek and Roman times. And uh, it was brought to Western attention, meaning Europe and North America, principally in the 19th century through the efforts of British Army surgeons. And one of the most prominent is Dr. William Shaughnessy, and in fact, one of the leading medical cannabis lay publications in co is called uh, O'Shaughnessy's after him. And then it was uh, a typical plant-based medicine in the US pharmacopoeia, just like cocaine-based medicines and opium-based medicines. Unlike those others, which were essentially outlawed by the Harrison Narcotic Act in 1914, it remained legal and widely used in the US until the late 1930s, and then was functionally outlawed by the imposition of a very high tax on prescribing or dispensing cannabis, uh, which is the correct term used elsewhere in the world and in botanical science, so I'll try to use that rather than marijuana. Um, it's an interesting social history about how this legal change took place. Not, not, we don't have the time to get into it, but I encourage anyone to read about it. I think it's an interesting socio-political uh, uh, example uh, of how science and politics interact. <clears throat> 
Uh, then, in 1970, this was codified at the federal level by the Controlled Substances Act that you're all familiar with, and uh, cannabis was put into Schedule One. actually not uh, apparently according to the Nixon tapes by uh, the scientific review that was supposed to be done by the FDA and HHS, but by administrative edict. Schedule One means it's, it's illegal to possess or dispense because cannabis supposedly meets three criteria. There's no, and this is quoting from the actual law, no currently accepted medical use and treatment in the United States, lack of accepted safety for use under medical supervision, and high potential for abuse. So if a substance meets those three criteria, it has to be in Schedule 1. Now, fortunately for state variations, there are a couple of little carve-outs in that, even under federal law. So under U.S. Uh, budget amendments, uh, it's been passed annually since 2014, the Aurora Backer Blumenauer, the Department of Justice cannot use any of its funds to prosecute state authorized medical cannabis entities. That actually is, is in the budget that was passed this January, so that's in effect through September of this year, uh, which gives some protection for states like uh, California, for example, that the Department of Justice federal attorneys will not go out and prosecute cannabis businesses or cannabis patients. Now, under the Controlled Substances Act, a physician cannot prescribe medical cannabis, nor can a pharmacy dispense it, because such prescriptions would be illegal. It's a Schedule One substance. So it's very different, let's say, from Israel. And again, no time in this talk, but I'm very interested in international comparisons. And not every country around the world handles cannabis the way the U.S. does. But under a U.S. Court of Appeals Ninth Circuit, meaning out of San Francisco, uh, almost 20 years ago, physicians can recommend or certify for medical marijuana or cannabis under the First Amendment. So again, uh, and no one has been prosecuted, as far as we know, for uh, recommending or certifying a patient for medical cannabis under a state law. So those are your protections. Now, interesting, there actually are several Medical, cannab ca medical cannabinoids that have always been legal under federal law, despite what I just said about the Controlled Substances Act. So synthetic THC, so if you make it in the lab, but don't get it from the plant, is perfectly legal. Brand na uh, generic name dronabinol, brand names Marinol and Syndros. I'm sorry, I left my phone on because my wife just had a medical procedure this morning and Um, is a Schedule Three uh, synthetic THC analog Nabilone is a Schedule Two. Uh, just last year, uh, plant-derived cannabidiol was approved, brand name Epidiolex. That's actually unscheduled uh, and um, under consideration for possible new drug application is Nabiximol's brand name Sativex. That's a one-to-one -one plant extract of. THC and cannabidiol, or CBD. That's already been approved in Canada and several European countries, but not yet in the US. And these uh, medications have FDA-approved indications. So dronabinol, nausea and vomiting, uh, chiefly from cancer chemotherapy or anorexia and weight loss due to AIDS. Uh, Nabilone, similarly, for nausea and vomiting. Uh, cannabidiol is for intractable childhood seizures. You've probably seen all the late publicity that got. Sanjay Gupta did a show on it. And the mixables, which is awaiting submission in this country, is approved elsewhere in the world for pain and muscle spasticity in multiple sclerosis, and uh, probably will be submitted for approval in this country for chronic cancer pain. So what is the current legal status at the state level? So uniformly at the federal level, Schedule One illegal. But at the state level, enormous variation. 33 states, the District of Columbia, Puerto Rico, and Guam have approved medical cannabis programs. 13 other states have what they call medical cannabidiol programs. So it has to have very low concentration of THC. And most states follow the federal law on hemp. So hemp is the cannabis plant, but with less than 0.3% THC. And uh, as a sidelight, the most recent uh, federal agriculture appropriation took jurisdiction over hemp away from the Department of Justice, the Drug Enforcement Administration, and put it back in the Department of Agriculture. So states now can set up legal uh, 
hemp programs. So going back to the history, hemp was a very valuable agricultural product. It was a major source of rope, fiber for rope, for, uh, for clothing and so on. EPA has actually just announced a research program to make concrete-like material out of hemp, which is biodegradable. Um, and now, if, if and when a state sets up a hemp agricultural program, that will all be legal, uh, federally. Uh, there's one entity, the Northern Mariana Islands, and if you plan on going there, that has only adult use, recreational cannabis, but no medical program. And there are four states, those are the gray ones on the map, uh, that have no cannabis program at all. So I mentioned the dark green, including California, are the 10 states that have both medical and adult use cannabis programs. So how many people actually use medical cannabis? Uh, do I have a pointer? Um, what? Just use the uh, cursor, right. Okay. So um, this is estimated data as of last May from a, a private nonprofit group, uh, Procon, their website. They estimated 2.1 million patients were registered in various state medical cannabis programs. And the, uh, the depth of green indicates the, uh, the per capita number of patients. So you can see that California is one of the top 10 states with 20 to 30 medical cannabis patients per 1,000 population. A uh, more accurate estimate comes from this uh, paper published earlier this year, actually counted up the number of patients registered in state medical cannabis programs. Uh, it's limited in coverage because only 17 states either actually require every patient to register and keep a count or are willing to release the count to the researchers. But even with that limitation, you see almost 900,000 patients were registered in 2017. So this is a substantial population that we're talking about. Now that same study also looked at what conditions the patients were taking medical cannabis for. This is an issue that also often comes up, again, not the topic of this talk, but what's the evidence, medically speaking, to support using cannabis for this condition or that condition? The answer to that, you have to come to my medical cannabis workshop at the APA meeting in San Francisco next month. Um, uh, as you can see, the vast majority of patients, again, in the 17 states that collect this data systematically and allow the researchers access to it, the, by far the commonest condition is pain, especially chronic pain, which makes sense if you look at the literature on cannabis effectiveness. Then much less frequent, but in order of frequency, are multiple sclerosis and uh, chemotherapy and so on. And this actually varies somewhat by the strictness of the medical cannabis reg regulation. This is an issue that comes up in interpreting the research. So in what the researchers called medicalized states, that is the regulations require some evidence of a bona fide doctor-patient relationship before you get the recommendation. I'll tell you another personal anecdote about I, I have relatives here that live in Los Angeles. I used to live in Westwood actually. And there, uh, about 20 years ago, there was a cannabis dispensary in a doctor's office on Westwood Boulevard. It's not there now, so I'll tell you, between, mid uh, between Ohio and wherever the next street up is. <laughs> so I couldn't get into the dispensary because I didn't have a doctor's recommendation. There was a guard at the door, which was locked. But the doctor's office, no problem. I didn't take the time to spend the $200 to see the doctor. But the literature said, no waiting. Don't have to take off your clothes. Complete privacy. We won't ask for any records. Tell me your problems. You'll have a recommendation within five minutes. So that's what I would call a medical cannabis mill. Now, I understand since then, California has tightened up some of the regulations. But there are still states that are like that or even allow the patient to grow their own without going to a dispensary. So that's medicalized states uh, with some strict controls. The other states are the non-medicalized. And you can see there's some variation, although the leading indication is still chronic pain uh, with multiple sclerosis, the next commonest. And again, multiple sclerosis is actually an approved indication outside this country for one of the cannabinoid products. If you look in general, and again, this is all I'll say about it, 
but uh, in this paper, they used as the gold standard for efficacy the 2017 National Academies report on the health consequences of cannabis, both positive and negative. We have in the audience one of the uh, uh, experts who worked on that report, Dr. Cooper. Uh, UCSF has another expert, Dr. Uh, Abrams. Um, so there were a few indications where they found um, conclusive or substantive uh, evidence. Oops. Uh, and as you can see, that includes uh, uh, chronic pain, nausea and vomiting, and so on. So there the evidence is consistent with the uh, frequency of use. But you have uh, some indications for which you have little or no evidence that are still fairly popular, particularly the psychiatric disorders, uh, anxiety, PTSD, and so on. Um, in fact, some states are by law saying treatment of opiate use disorder, we'll get to that in a minute, is an approved indication, and there's absolutely no evidence that medical cannabis has any efficacy for opiate use disorder. So in some cases, there's consistency with the scientific evidence. In other cases, there's not. But in terms of public health, most of the evidence comes from epidemiological uh, studies, which by nature are associational. So I just want to give you some cautions when you're interpreting the literature. Um, <clears throat> you should all, this should be review for everyone, hopefully, but associations do not prove causality. And this is especially true with use of a drug like cannabis, which is often used even by the same people for both recreational as well as medical use, and has a lot of legal and other social factors uh, influencing its use. Uh, for example, you could see a statistically significant association, but there's a common antecedent. So when one sees that there's increased cannabis use after a state changes its cannabis-related laws, it could be there's something about the socio-political environment in that state that contributes to both more people using cannabis, maybe less perceived uh, uh, dangerousness, something that the National Household Survey, by the way, tracks every year or uh, greater availability, which we know affects drug use, particularly by adolescents. Uh, and those same socio-demographic factors contributed to the political change in the cannabis-related laws. So you really look, need to look for the rigor of the design. And in my opinion, I'm not a professional statistician, by the way, but just an informed amateur. Um, uh, a more rigorous design is, for example, comparing difference in differences. So you look at the difference before and after an event like passage of a medical, medical cannabis law over time, but you compare those same two time intervals in states that actually changed the law and states that didn't. So you at least make some attempt to control for what we call secular trends. Because as we know, the whole social attitude towards cannabis has changed in the United States over the last few decades. But there are also some actual data validity problems that when I review the literature, you come across. So how does the study classify the status of the state's medical cannabis program? Is the program actually providing cannabis? Uh, passing the law doesn't mean there's actually a functional program from which patients are getting the drug. Uh, this is true in Maryland. Some of the studies actually that I'll show you data from actually classify Maryland's date as 2015. Correct, that's when the legislature passed the law, but for various political and other reasons, no dispensary was open to pass out cannabis till December of 2017. And even then, it was very limited. So it's hard to argue that over those two years, there was any effect of cannabis. And as I already mentioned, the strictness of the regulatory programs in some studies where it's been looked at seems to make an effect. Can you grow your own cannabis, which a few states still allow, versus having to get it at a licensed dispensary? how medicalized is the program in terms of the required physician-patient relationship. So here's an example from, uh, uh, as I was discussing earlier, a lot of this data, while I think it's well-designed studies, it's not in the peer-reviewed literature. This is from a report last year from Claremont McKenna College. I can give you the original reference. It's not been peer-reviewed, though. And you can see, even in 2015, the light gray are states with medical cannabis laws, but uh, light blue, I'm sorry. The dark blue are counties that actually had functional dispensaries. And you can see there's not a one-to-one -one relationship. 
And finally, there are some studies which look at the so-called substitution phenomenon, which I won't get into much today. Uh, you look at patients taking medical cannabis and you say, let's say for pain, a very common use, at least two-thirds of patients, did you decrease your use of opiate analgesics or other pain modalities? So I just picked at random one New Mexico study. I don't want to mention the authors. I don't want to pick on them, but they published a study of 64 chronic pain patients in medical cannabis programs, about two-thirds of whom said the use of cannabis allowed them to stop their use of prescribed opiate analgesics. Well, some other researchers went back. New Mexico has a prescription monitoring program, so they, I don't know how they got the permission, but they found out that 37% of those who said yes, they'd stop using prescription opioids with medical cannabis were still, according to the program, getting prescriptions. Now, it's still possible they were still getting the prescriptions but not taking them because of the medical cannabis, but draw your own conclusions. So you just have to be very cautious in interpreting the literature that's out there. Okay, so I'm an optimist, so let's start with the public health benefits. What you've been reading about a lot is this can help us deal with the current opioid crisis. It'd be very nice if it did. So there are four main ways that this has been touted or advertised. One, it might decrease opioid analgesic prescribing, as I just uh, mentioned. And there are studies looking at Medicare Part D enrollees and Medicaid enrollees. So you have large claims-based databases. You can do some epidemiologic or population-based studies. Uh, even if you're getting opioid analgesics, it might decrease their misuse. So you could measure treatment admissions for a prescription opiate use disorder. Or you might have decreased opioid analgesic overdose deaths. Now, just as an aside, this is probably less important than it was several years ago because we now know physician prescribing a prescription opioid analgesic has decreased drastically, especially since the CDC guidelines. And at least in Baltimore, many of the deaths come from illicit synthetic opioids, fentanyl or fentanyl analogs. And that may not, may not be helped by using uh, medical cannabis. Uh, lastly, as I mentioned, some states are touting uh, using medical cannabis as a treatment for opioid use disorder. In my opinion, there's absolutely no evidence for this. I have no studies to show you. Okay, so what is the evidence for this effect on medication prescribing? So this is a study from 2016, so it's several year old data looking at Medicare Part D enrollees. And what they're comparing, without going into the methodological details, are states that had a medical cannabis law, how prescribing changed before and after the law, versus states, same time periods, but didn't make the change in the law. And you see a substantial, significant decrease in analgesic prescribing. So this is, uh, their estimate is you have over 1,800 fewer daily doses prescribed annually per physician. So statistically significant and perhaps modestly clinically significant. Uh, a similar study done last year, uh, same idea for Medicaid enrollees. And here they're comparing uh, states with medical cannabis laws and a few states with adult use or recreational uh, cannabis, uh, cannabis laws. Same time intervals with states that didn't make a change in the law. And so you see, in absolute terms, a decrease in prescribing of all opiates, but look at the 95% confidence in intervals. These are not really statistically significant. The press releases, by the way, may not always tell you about what the range of variation was. Uh, but if you look specifically at Schedule II opioids, the more potent ones, you do see a statistically significant decrease, not in the medical cannabis states, but in the adult use states. So maybe people are self-medicating and that's having an effect. The uh, Schedule three to five opiates, uh, no significant difference. And then the, these authors also look at individual states, and I don't have an explanation for this state variation. Uh, the authors didn't either. It may have to do with subtle differences like the degree of medicalization or whether you can grow your own or not. But you see some st a few states, uh, Massachusetts, uh, Minnesota, and, and New York, have a significant decrease in prescribing when medical 
cannabis was enacted into law. Adult use, uh, three of the four states showed a significant decrease. So there's some effect in some states. Now, how about treatment admissions for substance use disorder? Um, so here, again, they're looking at changes over time. It's like a difference within difference. So uh, year zero is the year the change in the law occurred. And then they look before that and after that. Uh, and the left-hand panel in this slides are states when they had the medical cannabis law. And then the right-hand panel, I think, is more important. That's the year they actually had functional dispensaries. Cannabis was actually being given out. So you see for uh, treatment admissions, no uh, you know, a decline, but really not statistically significant based on the confidence intervals, just for passing a medical cannabis law. But in the right panel, uh, starting a year, one to two years after having functional dispensaries, you do see a decrease in treatment admissions. Now that's not just opiates, that's all substance use disorders. They didn't break it down for just opiate use disorder. Same approach looking at per capita opioid related deaths. This is mainly overdose, overdose deaths. And again, you see just passing a medical cannabis law at year zero doesn't seem to have a significant effect. But again, starting one to two years after you have functioning dispensaries, you see a significant decline. So maybe there's something to it. Okay, now th th this uh, study, again, it's not peer-reviewed. It's a report from uh, Claremont McKenna. Looks at uh, counties that had operating medical cannabis dispensaries. Uh, so the left-hand side of each of these panels is, so uh, the, uh, so let me take it. So when it says 2009, along the y-axis, none of these counties had operating dispensaries in 2009. By 2015, some did and some didn't. That's the y-axis. So it's looking at the association over time. So you want to see if the curves um, of that association differ depending on uh, whether the counties adopted, uh, had an operating dispensary by 2015 or not. And to make a long story short, all of the curves differ to some extent. That is, if you opened an operating dispensary between 2009 and 2015, you had decrease in this uh, opiate overdose deaths among non-Hispanic non white men. I'm not sure why they limited to that population, probably sample size, so we can't generalize. Overall, they estimate about 6 to 8% fewer opioid overdose deaths because of a county opening an operating cannabis dispensary. So what, one more possible public health benefit that um, has some data supporting it. Uh, this goes back to the study I mentioned earlier. If you look at some of the other psychoactive medications in this study of Medicare Part D enrollees, you see significant decreases in prescriptions annually per physician for antidepressants, anti-anxiety medications, antipsychotic medications, uh, seizures. Again, there's good evidence that cannabis could be effective and sleep disorders. No change in prescribing for glaucoma and for spasticity. So that acts as a possible positive control. They're not just seeing an overall decrease in prescribing uh, with the change in the law. Uh, let me just say, I put on the slide for completeness. I found one study purporting to show that changing the medical cannabis law was associated with a 2 to 6 percent decrease of uh, population being obese never been replicated. I'm not sure what the mechanism is. Obviously subject to a lot of potential confounding because we know that cannabis stimulates the appetite or people may be taking uh, medical cannabis uh, who, uh, because they want to increase their weight or something, stimulate the appetite. And decreased alcohol use, that is another substitution drug, positive and negative studies. So jury is still out. Okay, now, people are also worried about, of course, the harms. So I think the three uh, or the, the two most discussed harms are increased cannabis use or increased cannabis use disorder. And here, in my opinion, the, the 
evidence is decidedly mixed. So there are some epidemiological analyses, population-based, same design. You look at before and after some date when the law changed and compare that with states, same dates, but no change in the law. Show maybe some increase in use in, in adults, but not in adolescents, probably the population you're more concerned about at risk. And similarly for actual cannabis use disorder. Some studies, but not all, show increase in adults, which may depend on the degree of cannabis regulation, but not in adolescents. And the substitution with increased alcohol use, again, a mixed picture. So here's an example uh, from a recent study by Debbie Hassan and her group at Columbia. Uh, sorry, uh, well, you actually, you can see it better up there than I can on my computer screen. <laughs> So you're looking at the difference in slopes between the different lines, but just to summarize it, if you look at the text on the right, uh, in states that passed a medical cannabis law versus never did, you had a slight but significant increase, 1.4 uh, person per, uh, uh, I'm not sure what that stands for, I apologize, slight increase in the, in the incident, uh, prevalence of, um, of uh, cannabis use. Um, and if you look over 2001 to 2013, uh, the authors did several comparisons, sensitivity analyses. If you look just at a late adopting state versus never adopted medical uh, cannabis laws, you again, so you're eliminating some of the early adopters like uh, California, Washington State, which had looser regulation early on in the 1990s. You still see a significant increase and, and then comparing specific states like California and Colorado versus states that never changed their law, you still see. So this is the evidence of a statistically significant modest increase in adult use of cannabis with a change in the law. And similar pattern for cannabis use disorder. This is the same uh, study. So um, There's also been interest in uh, increase in motor vehicle accidents, certainly phenomenologically, several states, Colorado, California. I went online uh, recently, so uh, California Highway Patrol has reported, a, I don't know, a 30% increase in uh, automobile accidents uh, where the driver was uh, uh, using cannabis. Uh, but it doesn't definitely prove that this is due to a change in the laws, clearly, uh, the more you use cannabis, the more you're at risk for cannabis-related accidents. Um, and I think most everybody believes cannabis acutely impairs driving ability. I mean, you have observational studies, roadside drug testing, post-mortem testing of accident victims, so that's fatal accidents. And even interventional studies in driving simulators, closed course driving, and not in the U.S., but a couple of studies in Europe, they actually let drivers freely drive with somebody tailing them with supervision. So uh, my view of the literature um, is a 30 to 100% increase in accident risk if you're under the influence of THC. This is based on meta-analyses of large, well-controlled observational studies, principally from Europe. The EU was actually funded very, several very large studies. And there's some evidence that a blood level of THC greater than five nanograms per milliliter increases the risk of a fatal crash. But the problem here in terms of, for example, per se laws like alcohol, you know, if you're above a certain level, you're under the influence, criminal sanctions, because there's not a close association between THC levels and performance impairment because of the pharmacokinetics of THC. So within the first several hours of intake, yes, you'll have acute impairment, motor-wise, cognitively, although that may vary depending on your degree of tolerance. But because THC, especially, is stored in body fat, a regular user may test positive for weeks after last use. We did some such studies when I was at NIDA, uh, done for other reasons. We took regular recreational users, meaning often smoking several joints every day for years on a locked ward when we had that. They're still positive for four or five weeks afterwards, and others have done this as well. So you can test positive but not be impaired, either cognitively or in terms of motor coordination, which creates a conundrum for states. Uh, although, as this slide shows, five states 
went ahead anyway and adopted per se laws. Not California, but uh, Washington and uh, Montana, two examples. Typically, the, point, the five nanograms per ml. So I think that just makes money for defense lawyers because uh, you could easily show, if you educate the jury on pharmacokinetics, that it doesn't prove that the person was uh, had, uh, driving impaired. Uh, again, not to say, though, that there's a close association. So uh, this slide shows uh, the association between fatally uh, injured drivers who had cannabinoids in their body at the time of the accident and the medical cannabis law changes. And what you see here, is if you look at just the... Uh, the squares, so the squares are taking into account in the analysis some of the known confounders like prevalence of cannabis use and any changes in the method of drug testing that they use. Um, there's still significant association in some states, such as California, but in other states the significant association disappears. So it's a, unfortunately a common phenomenon in associational studies of the consequences of cannabis, like IQ and school performance, people have actually charted this. The more confounds you include in, let's say, multivariate analysis, the less strong the association becomes. So that gives me pause of what's really going on here, because there's always a possibility of unmeasured or unknown confounds. That's certainly true in the relationship, at least with the fatal accidents and cannabis. But even with that control, certainly some states show a significant association. Uh, another concern, especially in Colorado with the popularity of edibles, um, is um, calls to poison control centers. This is the same pattern with emergency department visits. Uh, since the change in the law, you see the curve going up rather than down. Uh, and this is particularly among children who get access to edibles that were improperly packaged. So I'm not aware of any fatalities, but certainly parents get concerned. They take the child in child's in a coma for several hours. Um, actually, I, I, I was at a internet, uh, cannabis research conference at the uh, uh, Cannabis uh, Institute for Cannabis Research at Colorado State University, Pueblo, uh, and there was a case report of someone who died of myocarditis, but everybody admits uh, it was very circumstantial. They hadn't ruled out other causes and so on. Some experts would say still no one has died from a pure cannabis overdose not complicated by other CNS sedatives like alcohol or benzodiazepines. There are certainly deaths from the psychological effects of cannabis, uh, you know, like with LSD, people who uh, get uh, injured because they lose their executive function and don't take behavioral precautions. Okay, so uh, the last uh, ha potential harm, which I was interested in because of work I did with uh, methadone, is, uh, is, is there crime, more crime around dispensaries, right? It's the old NIMBY issue. Um, uh, no, no, no community in California when I lived here and Maryland when I moved there wants a methadone clinic in their neighborhood, right? Um, so there is now a growing body of uh, evidence using different statistical techniques, which I think shows there's not good evidence that there is an increase in crime. But let's go through it briefly and then I'll stop for for questions. So this is another uh, not peer-reviewed uh, study by Priscilla Hunt and colleagues who's right down the road at Rand in Santa Monica. This was actually published as an Institute for Labor Economics report last year. That's a German research entity. I, I don't know how that they happen to publish it, but I think it's good data, good design. So this graph just shows over time the prevalence of DUI arrests by California County. Uh, so the upper line is counties that never opened a dispensary, and the dotted line is counties that allowed it. And the point here is they're essentially parallel. I mean, there are ups and downs because of secular trends, but the two lines are always in the same direction. It doesn't suggest that opening a dispensary increases DUI arrests. But then they did a more, I think, rigorous, this difference in difference. So year zero, again, is the year that a cannabis dispensary opened in that county. So it's more fine-grained. It's not just the year that California legalized it. 
And uh, they looked at various categories of crime. So here's violent crime. So again, you're comparing the difference between counties that opened a cannabis dispensary and ones that didn't. And, and then the uh, year zero was the year that they did. Uh, so here again, it looks like there may even be a decrease in violent crime, but if you look at the confidence intervals, it's probably not statistically significant. Similarly, DUI arrests, that's not really significantly increased. Uh, what you do see is a secular trend that it's going up across the state. That could be better enforcement or more public awareness. You know, a lot of non-cannabis related reasons for that. Property crimes, also no change. And misdemeanor cannabis arrests, no change. So this study, at least in California, doesn't show any evidence for increased crime in counties with a cannabis dispensary. Aha, but what if you look at a more fine-grained view? So here's a study of Long Beach, California, looking at census blocks, not the whole city or the whole county, but census blocks. So this is looking at violent crimes. Interesting phenomenon. Uh, clearly, more work needs to be done. There was no increase in violent crime in the immediate area around the um, cannabis dispensary. But in the adjacent census block, there was a significant increase. Uh, I mean, clinically significant, 2%. So the odds ratio was 1.0248. But the 95% confidence interval does not cross one. So I have to say that's statistically significant. Um, their hypothesis of the authors was that better policing around the dispensaries prevented an increase in crime. But it drove the increased crime to the adjacent census block. Similar pattern for property crime, so I won't go into it. So uh, one approach that I haven't seen done yet is when I was at NIDA, I had a fellow. So you can do geospatial analysis in terms of concentric rings about the site of interest. Because now m most major city police departments uh, uh, geocode their crimes, you know, the exact place that it, uh, that it occurred, and you can geocode your site of interest. In this case, it was methadone clinics in Baltimore City. And uh, she published two papers on that, uh, Dr. Susan Boyd. Um, and what you see is, uh, I think she did it in 100 meter concentric circles. You do not see any increase in crime compared to other crime hotspots. So criminologists say high foot traffic is associated with crime. So we looked at uh, health clinics, not methadone clinics, but general hospital medical health clinics. We looked at convenience stores, we looked at liquor stores. Now, some of those are already known. Liquor stores have higher rates of crime right around them, certainly in Baltimore. I don't know about Los Angeles. Uh, so that's a positive control. The methodology works. It picked up a known phenomenon, but we didn't see that about methadone clinics. I'd like to see somebody do that about around cannabis dispensaries. That would be an interesting study for anybody out there. And of course, submit that paper to the Journal of Cannabis Research. Thank you. All right. I'll stop there, and we have time for questions. Thank you. like a field identification procedure, you know, like the police make you walk a line and do things to show whether you have right. alcohol intoxication. So Everyone hear like the that. question or do I need to repeat it? This is being recorded, you know, Jim. Yeah, so field identification <laughs> of marijuana intoxicated drivers. Yes, well, procedures? that's what I would recommend. The answer is yes. So even when I was at NIDA, one of my colleagues worked to standardize that. So police departments in this country all over the world have federally approved standard field sobriety tests. 
and they work just as well for effects of cannabis as they do for alcohol or benzodiazepines. I think, and again, I'm not a criminologist, the issue is if you had a per se law, you'd save a lot of police time. And also, there's still some subjectivity, even if you train officers and do it regularly. It certainly would be quicker, more efficient, maybe even cheaper to just, you know, take a breath test. There is no breath test, by the way, for anything but um, uh, alcohol currently. Um, you, well, you, I mean, the next best thing would be take a, a swab of oral fluid. That's now fairly accepted. So you don't even have to get blood. Um, but it still has to go back to the lab, be tested, and so on. But without a per se level for that, you have to fall back on the old-fashioned field sobriety test. So it does exist in standardized form, yes? I did. I have um, to put in a pitch. My, my uh, attending as a senior resident on your uh, 210 ward with Ted Van Putten. Right. <laughs> and I'm still in 210. <laughs> it's not in 210 anymore? No, I'm still there. Oh, okay. But I, wow, 40 but years I, ago. <laughs> my question. Uh, <laughs> is, is a consequence of uh, legalizing cannabis for recreational use that plasma concentrations go up because it's more potent cannabis? And uh, what, what are the sort of implications of uh, more, I, I, I assume that people are more likely to use oral cannabis so that they have uh, you know, you know, kind of a different kind of kinetics. Has anyone looked at those effects and uh, uh, you know, how they would affect crime and intoxications and things like that? Uh, good series of questions. Um, so I intentionally stayed away from adult use or recreational cannabis. The field doesn't like recreational, by the way, because many people using outside of a medical cannabis program still say they're using it to self-medicate just without a doctor's recommendation. So the preferred term, at least in the, in, in the commercial industry, is adult use. If you look at the, like the National Council of State Legislatures, where I got those maps from, it's adult use. Um, it's, it's even more controversial than uh, medical cannabis, so I think it's important to have a calm, informed discussion, to have a clear distinction between the two. Because fewer states have legalized adult use, and it happened more recently, we don't yet have enough data, so you don't see the kinds of difference within difference uh, studies at the epidemiologic population level are just now starting to be done. You just don't have the, um, the literature. Uh, I'd, I'd like to know if, so a few countries have completely legalized adult use. Canada, last October, Uruguay several years ago. Uh, I don't get to international meetings much anymore, being semi-retired, but I would hope uh, some of those countries are doing these kinds of surveillance epidemiologic studies where you can see what are the long-term effects. I think uh, knowing your field of specialty, you're also implying a question. There's no doubt that the potency of seized cannabis in this country and also in Europe. Uh, again, if you come to my workshop in May, I have nice slides on that. <laughs> has increased substantially. That is, the, the potency is usually defined in terms of content of THC or the ratio of THC to CBD, for reasons I don't have time to get into. That's definitely gone up in the last two decades, intentionally. I mean, you know, sellers know their market. Most adult users want the effects of THC, the high. So does that mean there might be increased risk of developing non-affective psychosis when you use it as an adolescent? Because actually walking over here, some of the faculty were asking me about that. I'm sure that's a field that you follow closely. So that's a complicated issue worth its own 45-minute lecture. But just to summarize, I think there's good evidence from prospective longitudinal studies, so it's still associational, not causal, that regular use of high-potency cannabis, especially uh, in early adolescence, let's say before age 16 or 17, uh, produces an increased risk of non-affective psychosis, and probably also at least some cognitive impairment. Although, again, not every study is consistent. And you, I was asked about this study that just came out from uh, Maria Forte's group in London about this case control study at three st cities in uh, 
in Europe, London, Amsterdam, I forget the other one. Uh, I haven't had a chance to look at it directly, but that, if it's a case control study with all the limitations and caps, but that clearly showed, uh, I think for regular users of high potency cannabis, I think the uh, odds ratio of frequency use was like 10 to one, I mean, really significant. On the other side, and I, unfortunately I have not tracked down the study, but I've read about it, some epidemiologists in Britain uh, tracked the increase in cannabis use in the general population, same as we've seen here over the last two decades, and the incidence of schizophrenia, which should be fairly accurate because the National Health Service, they're probably capturing all cases at least that are severe enough to come to medical attention. You don't see a corresponding increase, so draw your own conclusions. Someone who doesn't know me, so that you're out, Edie. I don't know the Assung fellow. I have a question regarding the efficacy of um, medical cannabis on multiple sclerosis. So, in those studies, were they considering only like the physical symptoms associated with the disorder, or did it also like encapsulate like secondary um, symptoms like major depressive disorder? Right. The primary outcome measures and the measures used to get regulatory approval in Canada and some European countries and probably in this country eventually are the physical ones, pain and muscle spasticity. Thank you. Uh, in, in most of these studies, subjective effects would be considered an adverse effect actually. So you do, it is reported as a side effect. What do you think about uh, the legal system incorporating the use of saliva tests for recent use? Well, first I have to say, having worked with a world expert on that at NIDA, Dr. Marilyn Eustis, who as you know, it's called oral fluid because it's not all from the salivary glands. There are other, if you, those of you in med school, you probably forgot about that one hour lecture on oral health we had. So if you, but if you look in the literature, the companies that sell these tests, it's oral fluid, not saliva. So that's just a technical point. Um, yeah, I was involved when I was at NIDA. Uh, oral fluid is a, uh, a filtrate of plasma. It usually tracks very closely, at least for the drugs that have been studied, like THC, cocaine, uh, with what you find in the blood. So in a lot of field uh, circumstances, like roadside testing, you're, you know, you can't do blood at a roadside. You've got to take them to the hospital, the ER, get the ER doctor to draw the blood, and that creates all kinds of problems. So I think, my, I'm not a forensic toxicologist, but yes, oral fluid testing, at least for the drugs where it's been validated, THC, cocaine, opioids, and so on, uh, seems to be equivalent to blood. Well, if you had to do, if you have to do a field or on-site thing, you would get oral fluid, yes. Oh, and in Europe, they already do that, yes. Someone I don't know yet, Dr. Rowe. Thank you, and it's just, uh, just Brad. MPP never, never went that far. Um, so I wanted to ask about the consistency of uh, collecting the data about uh, cannabis-involved uh, incidents, uh, and so bodily harm or, or death, uh, and the way that's being collected by, by law enforcement officers. Uh, because we have a lot more people, much more casually using and keeping cannabis in their vehicles or, you know, having a, you know, in the backseat or having passengers who might be impaired. Um, and I'm just wondering about your thoughts on uh, what's happening with the data on, on cannabis-involved uh, incidents and, and, and how that's uh, being reflected right. in, in the press. Well, it depends on what kind of incident you mean. So, uh, I mean, cannabis-associated deaths principally comes from medical examiners and emergency department physicians. So. There's a growing literature, particularly in Colorado, which uh, you know has been a leader in this effect. Paper just came out last week in the Annals of Internal Medicine. That again, I've downloaded, but haven't really looked at. Uh, looking at that, but um, as I recall, some of the tables again, none of the cannabis-related admissions or deaths are very rare. But even there they're actually the psychological effects of cannabis. I wouldn't say they were physiologically developed, right? Someone making a suicide attempt or jumping in front of a car, or jumping off a building, similar to what you know we went through in the 60s and 70s with LSD. I don't know of any report where LSD actually killed somebody, but people died under the influence of LSD thinking they could fly. So those seem to be the cannabis-related 
uh, deaths. And the majority of admissions were, were what they coded as, as psychiatric related. I mean, there's some cardiovascular uh, consequences of using cannabis, if that's what you mean, but de deaths are still very rare and usually psychologically caused. Yeah, it was, it was more of officers showing up on site uh, of an automobile accident and finding paraphernalia or finding passengers or people with with cannabis and coding it as a cannabis involved accident. Right. So I don't know police actually I don't know police procedures very well in the US, but a lot of the major studies that I cited are from Europe and they do very research quality uh, data collection. This is a big uh, emphasis of the European Union, for example. So if it's a, to be cannabis related, they either f have detected cannabis either in the breath test or blood, typically, in Europe, or the driver acknowledged that they had recently used cannabis. So I, I'm pretty confident in that kind of data, yes. Sir, thank you for a good background. Thank you.